This is the Oracle Q&A webinar presented by Miro Consulting. We'll begin shortly. We're just giving everyone a chance to log in. All right, let's get started. Welcome to the Oracle Q&A webinar presented by Miro Consulting. My name is Sean Donahue, and I'm the VP of Marketing at Miro Consulting. Joining me today are Elliot Colon, Miro Senior Vice President, and Wayne Federico, Miro CIO and Chief Analyst. A little bit us, about us here at Miro. We specialize in Oracle License Management, Oracle Audit Defense, and Oracle Cloud Services. We also provide the same services for Microsoft, IBM, and Adobe. If you have questions during the broadcast, please use the question box in your webinar control panel, and we'll answer them at the end of the session. Your questions will only be visible to the presenters. Neither your questions or personal details will be shared with Oracle or any other vendor. So with that, I'd like to start us off with our first question of the day. Uh, I will, here we go. What is your take on Oracle's recent document regarding licensing in cloud environments, specifically AWS or Amazon Web Services? Will this double license cost or can hyperthreading still be enabled to take advantage of the 0 0.5 core factor? Wayne? Yes. Um, Okay, we've gotten plenty of questions from this over the uh, last several months since Oracle made the change on January third, twenty uh, third. Um, the, the the it's complicated uh, all of the different aspects of this, but it really kind of comes down to the result of that when you apply the new licensing perspective that Oracle has uh, indicated it doubles the amount of licenses you would need to apply against an AWS uh, environment or a Azure environment um, compared to Oracle um, that you previously needed to apply. So if you needed to apply for uh, you know, four processor licenses against a particular environment, now you have to have eight for the same footprint, right? Same amount of power. Um, now, this is specific to Enterprise Edition. Um, when it comes to Standard Edition, it affects it differently because Standard Edition didn't utilize a core factor table at all. Um, and because of that, it, it really doesn't have the same effect. Uh, but what it does affect for at least Azure is that it actually causes it to be half powered. So you're essentially getting half the amount of power uh, when it comes down to um, what, you, what you are able to license against Azure because of SE standards. It kind of limits um, the use of SE more in regards to how many cores you can apply. Um, a lot of it has to do with the definitions. That's what makes it so confusing. We've actually had produced um, documents that we sent out to all of our retainer clients that kind of explained all of the details in regards to the different changes. Um, but essentially, what Oracle did was they removed that actual core factor. Yet for the calculation for, uh, this is for Enterprise Edition again, for the calculation against Enterprise Edition on an Oracle cloud, they actually embed it, even though they don't call it a core factor, they embedded the use of the core factor into the calculation that you would use against licensing you would apply to the Oracle Cloud. And for clarity, this is comes into play for any licenses that you're taking from your on-premise uh, perpetual assets 
at applying them against use in one of these uh, cloud environments. Um, so that essentially is it. It will double the cost. And the hyper-threading is, is kind of a separate type of thing. Um, the, the confusion there is, is that Oracle has never really utilized hyper-threading for any type of a licensing calculation. Nor are they really doing it here, but the topic gets pulled in, um, mainly because of the fact of what AWS, uh, Amazon Web Services, changed in the way in their own environment a couple of years ago in the fact that a vCPU is truly a single thread. Um, and the thing that kind of confuses a lot of people is Oracle's document that they produced that announced the change um, is, is not, it's a typical Oracle document, it's not super clear. Um, it seems more clear uh, to some when you read it, it seems to kind of be like, okay, um, but when you actually go to apply it, then is where all the questions pop up because it's, it really isn't actually that clear. Um, and it comes down to the hyper-threading aspect where you're really just um, there. It, the effect is just the doubling. You don't really have to worry about the hyper-threading. And also with AWS, you don't actually have the option to turn off hyper-threading. It implies, the Oracle document implies that you have the option, but you really don't when it comes to an AWS environment. You're picking an instance, and the bulk of um, Amazon's instances have hyper-threading enabled automatically, and it's at a level that is not uh, reachable by users. So you can't change that. It's kind of embedded in the way that works. There are some instances of AWS that are literally a single vCPU. And in those cases, those would actually, hyper-threading would not be in use because it is literally only a single hyper-thread. Um, but there is not a way for you to actually go in and turn off hyper-threading on or off. It really depends upon which one you are choosing. And the other confusion that added to things was with Microsoft and the Azure platform, you are not uh, there, the bulk of their instances do not have hyper-threading enabled. Um, they don't utilize hyper-threading in their cloud. They have since started to launch stuff that does offer hyper-threading, and we expect very much so that that's going to be treated the same way that AWS is for their environment, for the way that is. Um, but that's where that is. So it, it is kind of complicated, but uh, that's, uh, that's where it stands. Okay, next yeah. question. Uh, Elliot, did you want to? Oh, one, one, one quick thing to add to that is it, it, that, it, you know, and as Wayne has kind of already alluded to, you know, this is pretty fluid at Oracle. I mean, the changes have been, have been uh, made in, in, in rapid succession over the last, um, you know, a couple of years in terms of, you know, how Oracle's counting for, for different deployments and different uh, uh, flavors of the cloud. So, you know, we would anticipate additional changes uh, to be made as, as, as the rest of the year goes on as well. Okay, the next question actually goes, is a great follow-on to, to the first question uh, because it's the most uh, understandable question we get from everybody and relates to these changes. Uh, is Oracle going to allow some type of grandfathering of AWS environments that existed prior to this uh, January cloud licensing change? Um, we just got word uh, it took Oracle quite a while. We figured there would be some because in the past, we've seen Oracle um, have a level of grandfathering with these types of changes. Uh, we just weren't sure how. But we got confirmation um, about a week ago, a um, week or two ago, that Oracle will be uh, grandfathering, and it's going to be based on when the license was purchased. Um, they've done this in the past. They did this with the P6, um, IBM P6 changes they did years ago. This is how they handled that. So essentially, if you bought licenses that were during, um, you know, before January uh, from Oracle and you were applying them against the cloud, then those licenses you will be able to use the counting methodology that existed before January 23rd. Um, yeah. it, go ahead. 
Oh, and just, and just as, a, as a chime in on that one, just keep in mind that if you do license migrations or license assignments uh, or upgrades, um, yeah, that uh, you know, any time there's a, a, a you know, modification and a new CSI number granted uh, or a new agreement signed, um, you know, technically you could be um, you know, changing the date on that acquisition to a more current date. So keep in mind that if you, if you bought something you know, four years ago, let's say, and now you're doing a license assignment, license migration, license upgrade uh, today or for the fourth quarter of Oracle, um, understand that there's a, a real possibility you may be changing that acquisition date to today contractually. So it's just something to keep an eye on. Yeah. No, it will definitely be very fluid because even when we were questioning Oracle in regards to this grandfathering, it wasn't actually being presented in the most clear fashion. Um, we had tied it to the, uh, the aspect of to a licensing purchase because that's what they've done and they agreed that that's, that's how it uh, would function. So if you only owned, let's just say, uh, eight licenses that you applied against the cloud, and uh, you're not making any changes, and you haven't done any migration, you haven't anything, done anything else, and you purchased those licenses a year ago, uh, nothing changes. Uh, should you get audited, they're going to look at when that uh, was purchased. If you all of a sudden come into a situation where you need more licenses for that AWS environment, if you need to purchase new, let's say you need to purchase another four, then those four would have to be utilizing the current counting. So you would essentially need to allocate, uh, if you needed only four, then you'd need to li license uh, likely eight to add to that eight you already have. Now, if you had previous licenses that you're no longer using, that you were purchased a year ago, and you want to apply those, those you could apply um, and use the old licensing method based on when it was purchased. But again, that's why this gets so confusing, and it, and we saw it, you know, uh, with P6s and uh, the way those could get licenses allocated um, years ago. Same type of scenario within an audit, you know, depending upon when you purchased it, whether migrations happened, how you can use it, and so forth. So uh, there is something we have um, yet to see it kind of enter into a mode within an actual audit. But we're, you know, we were involved in audits uh, every day, so. We're expecting to start seeing them pretty soon, um, but that's that's where that's at. So that gives you some. You, you definitely have the possibility of, of a grandfathering, but you definitely need to be kind of clear in regards to how you're looking at that, um, so that it is it is going to be accepted um, by Oracle. So, next question: What scenarios would not require? And it, oh, I got to move this. Uh, N Enterprise Edition Data Guard uh, Physical Standby Instance to be licensed. Um, essentially, uh, and, and this is this has long been a confusion point uh, for clients because Data Guard, uh, the standard Data Guard, is is uh, comes with Enterprise Edition, um, so it, you don't have to pay extra for that. Uh, if you want to buy Active Data Guard, which is a option to Enterprise Edition, there's an additional purchase for that. Um, they have slightly different feature sets. Uh, Active Data Guard just adds on to uh, some capabilities with Data Guard. But when you are just buying Enterprise Edition, should you go to use Data Guard, um, the standby instance has to be licensed. Um, it, it essentially, it, it's kind of one of those triggers for Oracle LMS. Um, that requires you to, okay, that's got to be licensed. There's no kind of question about it. Um, so if you're using Data Guard, then you need to have that physical standby instance to be licensed for Enterprise Edition database. Again, you don't have to buy the Data Guard, but you ha it has to be licensed for Enterprise Edition database, and it has to be licensed utilizing the same metric. Um, it doesn't have to be uh, the same amount of licenses if your standby instances in a physical environment that is smaller in processing bandwidth than your primary, then it, it doesn't have to match exactly. But if you're using 
um, processor metric in your primary, you have to license your standby uh, for processor as well. So, um, and there's really no other way. I mean, when you're using DataGuard, that's that automatically sets that trigger, and you have to license it. So, okay, next question. Okay, what just happened? There we go. Uh, how are most companies dealing with Oracle product licensing when running VMware, VMware's latest versions? Okay. Um, still a lot of confusion out there um, with VMware, mainly because, you know, as Oracle does at times with some of their policies or most of their policies, is uh, when they come out with a change, they don't announce it to everybody. They don't, they rarely announce it to anyone. Um, so no one actually knows a change occurred. Also, they don't, uh, they typically don't make a policy change um, that affects a document, since a lot of their policies aren't even documented. Um, and VMware's is an example of that. There is no Oracle document that is a specific policy document. The only documents Oracle provides just reflect that Oracle does not um, recognize any features within VMware to be able to uh, um, segment processing power for licensing purposes. Um, doesn't make a difference if you're pinning um, processors to particular sessions. Uh, they don't care. Now, that's been the uh, case forever. Now, with version vSphere 4, they always looked at it from the perspective of um, ESX clusters was the licensing boundary. Now. Um, with the when they went to vSphere 5, which was April 2014, around the time when we started seeing this issue pop up with Oracle, um, the that changed because now Oracle is looking at it as the vCenter becomes the licensing boundary, so it's no longer the cluster. And, and if you're familiar with VMware, ESX clusters are entities that are within vCenters. Okay, and then a client can have multiple vCenters. So um, that kind of expanded to that. So uh, that becomes an issue, and then as well as when they went to vSphere 6, uh, that added an additional layer because that allows you to vMotion between vCenters, right? Because version 5 allowed you to um, Added the feature to the motion between ESX clusters, which caused it to go to the vCenter level. And with vSphere 6, now it's across vCenters you can vMotion, which now that kind of creates the entirety of your VMware environment. Oracle will try and say you need to license. Um, so there's ways you can segment um, that Oracle can accept, but again, it depends upon how what products you're running, where you're running them, how you're running them, um, how you have them separated up in your environment uh, to determine what segmentation may work best. Um, we do hear from people who will talk about um, the whole aspect of uh, logs, tracking logs. Um, and we've never seen that actually uh, function properly when dealing with Oracle as a pushback because VMware in and of itself does not have a very good, um, doesn't really have a clean way within its own software for you to be able to manage that log data. Um, because again, the, the concept behind doing tracking of logs is the log data shows when people are using vMotioning. So if you never use vMotion, then there's the proof. We're not using it, so we shouldn't be pro uh, licensing all of these different systems within our vCenters um, because we're not using it. That's uh, That may work better in smaller environments than it does in larger environments. Larger environments, stuff is always going on. Uh, in some places, you are doing vMotioning. Um, and what that can also you know uh, get you into is if you're trying to kind of prevent some stuff or making some changes, shifting some stuff around, that's all captured in logs. So, you know, what you're trying to use as proof could also be used against you as proof that you've done something that they don't like. Um, 
another thing that we always have to, to be very careful or um, caution clients on is a lot of clients will just go to Oracle and say, hey, um, I hear some things about VMware that you're telling, you know, hearing that you're changing the way the licensing is. I'm not sure I'm good. Uh, and Oracle can just be like, well, we'll take a look at that. Um, you open that door, uh, Oracle is not going to walk in and say, oh, you have to change these things around for it to fit what we will accept. Oracle is going to look at your environment and say, okay, that's the point in time. You know, any changes you make, that's fine and dandy, but we're going to uh, be judging your compliance based on the way your environment is set up now. Um, and, if, and, 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 just, and, and just to chime in there, um, it's a very, very important uh, point what Wayne is making on this call, is that um, validation of licensing strategies, um, you, you have to be very careful when you're bringing in the vendor for the validation of strategies that are in play. Um, because by, prevent, by providing you know, that evidence of the licensing that you've already deployed, you're essentially confirming the point in time compliance violation that you will not have any recourse against or, or be able to change. Yeah, Oracle is not going to, nor, nor many of the other large vendor software vendors are going to come back to you and say, okay, well, you know, thanks for the information. You know, they're not going to say, you know, here are options A, B, or C to change or remedy this. They're essentially saying, okay, you, it looks like you're using our software in clear violation of the software agreements. And as per those contracts, you, you all as a true up uh, compliance, uh, uh, basically a, a, a remedy of, of dollars at, at that moment. So you've already provided the factual evidence to support the claim that there's money due. Uh, and now you've pretty much eliminated any ability to then further reduce the environment, change the environment, or to negotiate. Um, because it cats out of the bag and you're already using the software in the way that's in violation. So just keep in mind that you know validation of strategies uh, you know should always be done either before the fact or or by you know third parties or, or by some kind of uh, 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 su suggested deployment and, and not by you know bringing a vendor in for for a review or a discussion based upon hard facts. Um, and then just to kind of you know close out the question as far as how people are using it, well, it, it's a combination. We know people who separate it out by vCenter. You can separate out within the SAN segments. You can separate out your VLANs. There's a couple different ways to to approach the topic and, and approach the the, the, uh, the best way to deal with it. But it also involves what products you're running, how you're running them, where you're running them, um, whether it's all tech, whether there's some apps, whether it's middleware. Um, production, dev, you know, all of those things come into play. So it, it's not a quick um, answer to that, but there is definitely some stuff that people have to consider within those environments because of the way we'll, Oracle will look at it. And it is not logical. Um, that's the, the biggest pushback we get from client base is that it's not logical and we never said it would be when it comes to Oracle. Um, that's not their normal view of things. Um, so. All right, next question. Um, how can we allow managers to view time cards that will not use a license? Right now they use OTL timekeeper view only. Okay, this um, relates to a, a, an area of um, when you're dealing with Oracle applications that trip up a lot of people. Um, because obviously you, you have users that just need very limited use. Uh, they don't need to actually be users, um, but you don't want to have a license them because that can get very expensive. Um, they just need kind of view rights. To some products, Oracle does offer um, a, uh, a view-only type of license, um, but that's only a small s sampling of products. The bulk uh, do not. So uh, the typical way that the clients have got around this is basically staying outside of 
the actual application. I mean, it used to be when Discover was the main um, type of reporting application out there that people use under Oracle, um, you could set up a separate Discover environment. It wasn't the way that Oracle actually um, recommended it or actually showed it uh, on their uh, MetaLink and support sites. They actually show you setting it up within uh, the actual e-business environment, except that kind of ropes you into, if you have to log into that environment, you would need a license and get you back down to the same issue you are trying to avoid. By having it separate, outside of it, it's you don't need to log in um, to the application, because all you're really looking at is a report. Um, now, Discover is getting phased out, has been phased out. Um, there's other products coming into play. But this is, this is something that you could also cover from even a third-party application if it's just from a reporting perspective, as long as you're paying for the license for that user at the database level. Because if you're accessing the database um, by a user for reporting, then they would have to be licensed for that. Not necessarily have to be licensed for the entire application, um, but they would at least have to be licensed for the database if that um, reporting tool is pulling data and accessing it for that user. Um, the, the other thing that you have to be particularly careful of, because a lot of people also write APIs to try and do this the same thing. They'll write an API so the actual user doesn't have to log in. Um, the API logs in. But Oracle does not view it that way. Um, use of APIs is just an extension of the application. So when it's an extension of the application, even if that end user never has to log into that application, if they're viewing data that's being pulled through an API, then that will require them, you have to get an application license for that user. Um, and we've seen plenty of situations where clients have gotten tripped up with that. So that would be, you know, um, as far as kind of a semi-quick answer, that would be the way I would address that aspect. Um, and you know, you contact us for further uh, assistance uh, to get deeper on that particular topic. Next question. Let's see. Okay. <clears throat> In an Oracle audit, how far back do they typically review? Um, Oracle typically does not. Uh, they, they do their audits as a point in time, so they're looking at things as of right now. However. The information that they're looking at um, could be from usage that may have occurred years ago. Um, so even though they're looking at licensing as it stands at the moment, that doesn't mean that it reflects usage as of this particular moment. The usage could have been a year, two, three years ago. Um, and it really depends upon what the databases, what the, the different logs and so forth is able to tell LMS. Now, the easiest examples are things like somebody loaded up a database on a server that, um, and we've seen this, where somebody used it um, literally just to support some kind of an upgrade they were doing, and they used it for all of like less than a month. Um, but nobody ever deleted the database. Well, no one's used it for a couple of years, but because that instance still appeared, um, Oracle would go after you to say, hey, you know, that that exists, That's that, that was used, and, you know, th th it gets a little more foggy if you, because if you had licenses at the time, you know, were licenses allocated to it, um, so the further they go back, it's a little bit more difficult for them to try and really press on people, um, but they can still try. The easier situations are when um, it shows that you had partitioning option loaded up on that database, and you never, ever owned the partitioning option, ever. So if you never owned it, and you had it loaded up at one point, well, then Oracle's going to say, well, it doesn't make a difference what you had loaded at the time, you never owned that license. So we can go after you for that. Um, whereas if it's the, just the database and you owned it at that time, then there's some aspect to say that, okay, well, that doesn't that hasn't been used in a long time, and we were probably licensed for it then, but but it doesn't stop them. We're still just trying to count it in the overall count. So um, so they can go back <clears throat> pretty far. 
um, but they are focused on what is currently in use. So if stuff is currently loaded up, that is really where they're focused on. But it could have been loaded up a couple of years ago. So that, that's where the, the danger exists. So um, did we get any other? Uh, yes, we do have uh, some additional questions. I just want to quickly say that if you have questions or concerns about your Oracle environment and would like it reviewed for compliance, uh, please contact us at uh, miroconsulting.com, sales at miroconsulting.com, or you can reach us uh, via phone at 732-738-8511, extension 1208. Uh, if we didn't get a chance to get to your question today, we'll get back to you via email, but we have time for one more question from the audience. Uh, Wayne, uh, we have the question about IBM Power 8 based server. So the question is, uh, are there special Oracle rules for IBM Power 8 based servers? Okay. Um, when it comes to Power 8, it, it's treated, uh, it's the same one-to-one -one type of rules that our um, Oracle looks at when it comes to even P7s. Um, their rules are slightly different in regards to the fact that um, a Power 8 or it really doesn't make a difference between Power 7 or Power 8, but the way IBM's power technology works in regards to setting up LPARs, um, whether you're dedicating, uh, whether you're sharing. Um, so there, the good news about a, a Power 8 platform is it does give you the capability of segmenting your processing power so that you only have to license a portion of an entire physical box. Um, which is different than what you'll see with VMware environments and so forth. And a big reason Oracle talks to that or allows that is the fact that it's, it's more controlled at a hardware level, which they're more comfortable with than something that's controlled just at a software level. Um, so the hardware level gives you that extra, extra flexibility. However, how you have that set up, whether it's shared, whether it's dedicated, um, and what it's shared within can make it a little more complicated in regards to how you count those licenses. Uh, but it does, um, it, does, uh, it does give that ability. So it is still a one-to-one -one, uh, type of uh, core factor with those. All right, thank you, Wayne. Thank you, Elliot. Uh, this will conclude today's webinar. Again, if you have further questions, would like a one-on-one -on -one session, please email us at sales at miroconsulting.com. Call us at 732-738-8511, extension 1208, or visit us on the web at miroconsulting.com. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you for attending, and have a great day. Thank you.